If you ask about who is Mordechai Van Nunu as an icon, he's considered by, by many Israelis as the most dangerous, threatening uh, spy uh, ever lived here. He told everything he knew for the first time to the world. This was the first time that Israeli told the story of Dimona as an employee, as an insider to the world. I can tell you at the White House, it changed the dynamics. I mean, now you had to deal with an Israel that might have nuclear weapons. It was a nightmare. It was the worst nightmare. Domestically, it nearly brought down the Israeli government. It's a story about human futility, human weaknesses. Uh, there is a lot of psychological dimension into this Vanunu case by all involved parties. And if you wish, in a way, it's a story about a boy meets a girl. In September of 1986, Mordechai Vanunu flew to Italy with a woman he had met just days before in London. Within hours of arriving in Rome, Vanunu was seized by the Mossad, Israel's secret service, and returned to Israel to face charges of high treason. The operation to recover Mr. Vanunu to the land of his nationality was, as has happened in a number of occasions by the Israeli security services, brilliantly accomplished and extremely simply executed. He fell into this stupid uh, trap, the honey trap. You know, if you want to write a bad B-movie script, you would write th that sort of uh, episode. The crime was so grave and serious of Vanunu that it justified bringing him back to Israel by whatever means. Vanunu, a former nuclear technician, was branded a traitor in Israel for revealing classified information to a foreign newspaper. Clearly, the fact that Mossad succeeded in getting him limited the impact of the story, but not as much as perhaps they'd hoped. This had been Israel's most closely guarded secret, and now it was on display to the entire world. Cases like him, I mean, betrayal of trust, are not very common in Israel. They are indeed very rare. Because of the cohesive force of being threatened from the outside, we, you don't find many people like him. Awaiting trial, Vanunu was now incarcerated in the town of Ashkelon at a maximum security facility. Here, he was visited by his lawyer. He was very composed, quite curious about what is happening. He had a lot of uh, complaints about the way he was treated, the way he was brought to Israel. He spoke very strongly on his beliefs that he did something which he was supposed to do. His act was one of whistleblowing and that in doing so, he shined a very bright light in a very dark corner. Now, there's nothing wrong with whistleblowing, but the topic he was trying to blow the whistle on was quite simply too serious, too important, and too deadly for them not to want to take the whistle away. And they did, and they did it quickly. Three judges presided over a year-long secret trial before finding Mordechai Vanunu guilty of espionage and treason. This verdict, which carried with it an 18-year prison sentence, gave rise to an unrelenting global campaign demanding Vanunu's release. Around the world, many people continue to question if justice was truly served in the case of the State of Israel versus Mordechai Vanunu. He is considered in the world as a whistleblower who exposed Israel's nuclear secrets uh, for the sake of humanity, 
to save the civilization from its own destructive instincts. But basically, I don't think that was his intention. Purity of motives are mixed with psychological factors, religious factors. You know, he's a very, very weird man who did something that many people approve of and many people disapprove of, but you can't understand the case without looking at the psyche of the criminal. From the age of nine, when his family emigrated from Morocco, Mordechai Benunu never felt at home in the Jewish state. At the time, Israeli authorities sent all North African immigrants to Beersheba, an undeveloped town in the middle of the Negev desert. My father was very disappointed because he was a person who had studied the Bible and he thought that he was coming to a land of milk and honey. Suddenly, he saw only desert. Mordechai attended religious school, but here too he felt alienated. His family was very traditional, Jewish traditional, orthodox, and suddenly he, he was protesting, rebelling against the family. I decided to cut myself off from the Jewish religion, but I didn't want to have a confrontation with my parents because I wanted to complete my studies. Therefore, I tried to fulfill my duties and be like everyone else. He was a good student. Um, he had a lot of religious training, and he wanted to go on to the university. So in order to go to the university, he had to find a job. By 1976, when Mordechai Venunu began his employment at the Demona nuclear plant, he was a man with profound yet undetected questions about his identity as an Israeli. Demona is perhaps the most secret scientific defense facility in Israel. And every one of its employees have been sworn to complete total secrecy. It is important to understand that from the early days of 1948, Israel was a nation under threat. Three or four million Jews, surrounded by 40, 60, 80 million Arabs, screaming jihad, make the sea run red with their blood. The leaders of the time, notably David Ben-Gurion, took a decision that we were not just going to have bows and arrows and spears and shields. We were going to have the big one. We realized at that time that we have to get help from outside, so we turned to the French. The, the major go-between was uh, Shimon Peres, who was then a young boy in charge of the French connection, if you want. In the late 50s, under a cloak of secrecy, Demona's nuclear research facility began construction. Over the years, rumors spread about what was happening there, but the Israeli government adopted a policy of ambiguity. No denial, no confirmation. When I was working there, you have to remember it was a different time. Israel was much smaller, and we had an idea that we are creating something that would serve Israel for a very long time and guarantee its existence in the very hostile Middle East. Before entering the facility, all employees, including Venunu, had to sign a document pledging total secrecy. Any breach of this agreement would result in an automatic 15-year prison sentence. By the early 80s, Venunu was a valued employee at Demona. However, he became disillusioned with his work and began testing the limits of his democratic rights. He became a student at the Beersheba University, named after Ben-Gurion. He started studying philosophy. Suddenly, he discovered the, the big philosophers, uh, Nietzsche and Kant and Descartes. And suddenly, he was demonstrating, associating himself with uh, left-wing causes. Venunu's political activities did not go unnoticed by Israel's internal security service, the Shabak. I knew that at work, they would start thinking that I was a security risk. Nevertheless, I decided not to act underground. I was interviewed by a student paper, and I spoke my views. Later, I also participated in demonstrations. It was obvious to me that the Shabak would get me, ask questions, and warn me. They said, look, it's very dangerous. You shouldn't do these things. You, should, you couldn't work at the nuclear reactor and be a member and being associated with the Arab students. You signed a contract 
in which you committed yourself to maintain secrecy. And Van Nunu said, there is nothing wrong with what I'm doing. It's a democracy. I can join any party. And they said, of course you can join any party you wish. That's not a problem. But some of these members are very radical. And we warn you, don't break your pledge and your contract. Despite several warnings from the Shabak, Van Nunu's political activities continued. In the summer of 1985, under the pretext of budgetary cuts, Mordechai Vanunu received notice that in the next round of layoffs, his job at Demona would be terminated. And he took it as a personal vendetta of the authorities and the system against him. With his days numbered as a trusted employee, Vanunu took a calculated risk. He decided to smuggle a camera into the top secret facility. The process was that he was quite crafty about it, according to how he described it. He, he, he put a camera one day, without any film, into his knapsack, which he took in every day to work. He was aware that on the bus that took him and a whole group of people, there were only cursory checks most days. They boarded their buses if they lived in Beersheba or in Dimona. They went with their bags, personal belongings, to the gate went through the gate, showed their badges, personal badges, and were allowed into the facility. If it got found in his knapsack, he would have just simply said, well, I didn't re I'd forgotten it was in there. I was at the beach yesterday, I took it with me, I'd forgotten to take it out. Within days of successfully getting the camera stowed away in his locker, Vanunu proceeded to smuggle in two rolls of film. There are many hundreds of people going in and out every day. And once you pass the security check, people are trusted in some way. Starting on the roof at dusk, Vanunu began his photographic assault. He was highly motivated. He was highly motivated and probably the technical obstacles that he had to overcome were only technical for him because of his drive and his uh, motivation. With fellow employees assembled in the canteen for a meal break, Vanunu moved undetected into the subterranean levels of Machan II. Here he was in the heart of the bomb-making plant, deep within the Demona complex. By the time the other employees returned to their stations, Vanunu had captured 57 exposures. He really betrayed the trust that was given to him. And he knew what he was doing. After leaving Demona, Vanunu decided to travel abroad. Mordecai traveled for quite a long time after he left Demona, and he had the film that he took in his backpack for months before he even got it developed. Vanunu drifted through the Far East before landing in Sydney, Australia in May of 1986. One evening, while wandering the streets of King's Cross, Sydney's red light district, Vanunu was drawn to the lights of St. John's Anglican Church. He left Judaism, and that has to do uh, a lot with his perspective about the world, about Israel, about the Jewish people, he lost hope. And side by side, he actually left the family. In the summer of 1986, Mordechai Vanunu was baptized a Christian. The big thing for him was giving up his Judaism because um, his father was a sort of small-scale rabbi in Israel. It's interesting that he needed to go all the way to Australia, perhaps the further away from Israel possible, converted into a Christian. And only after doing those things, being so far away from Israel and considering himself no more Israeli or Jew, only then he was able to tell his story. I think the view of Mordecai within Israel was definitely made more complex by the fact of his conversion. That even though certainly there are a lot of Israelis who are not religiously observant, the actual act of converting was seen on another level 
to a lot of Israelis as a betrayal. Vanunu became active with the social concerns group at the church. Here, he spoke openly about his previous employment at Demona. It was around this time that he met a Colombian journalist named Oscar Guerrero. Oscar Guerrero was, was a man of all seasons. He was an adventurer, in a way a con man. He was a literary agent, a film agent. And above all, I think he wanted to make money. Upon hearing that Venunu had two rolls of unprocessed film from inside Demona, Guerrero convinced him to develop them. And he imposed himself on Mordechai, the confused Mordechai who didn't know the, the ways of the world, to represent him, if you wish, as a literary agent to sell his story. They went to the local photomat, where Israel's nuclear secrets now rolled off the presses in full view of all passing by. With pictures in hand, Guerrero approached various local publications. He went from one newspaper to another and was turned down by all these newspapers. He was introducing Vanunu to them. This is my story, look at him, he is real. But they didn't want to believe that such a thing could happen, that someone from Israel's most secret installation would manage to sneak out these photographs. With the flamboyant Guerrero as his sales agent, Venunu's activities were anything but low-key. Reports filtered back to Mossad headquarters in Tel Aviv. They were getting information from the Australian intelligence service about what Venunu was doing. Now, they know they have a bad situation when he's in Australia. So what do you do about it? Traversing three continents, the Mossad would now mount a legendary operation. By mid-August of 1986, Mordechai Vanunu and his representative, Oscar Guerrero, had exhausted all local options in their efforts to sell Israel's nuclear secrets to the Australian press. Eventually, Guerrero landed in London, where he made contact with the Sunday Times. My main concern was, is this information that he's providing correct? What are his motives? Is he the person he claims to be? In other words, is there someone called Mordechai Vanunu from Israel who could have worked at Dimona? Intrigued, Peter Hounam flew to Sydney to meet Venunu. The two men set up a slide projector in Venunu's hotel room. The former nuclear technician now elaborated on the images, little by little, shedding his secrets. He was able to produce a copy of his passport. He had a testimonial from Dimona. At the end of a week or two, I had a huge amount of information that I was gradually feeding back to London where experts were able to begin trying to sift what he was. Confident that Venunu was a reliable source, a deal was struck. We were not going to pay him for the story in the Sunday Times, but we would help him with a book contract and a TV contract and so on. In fact, Venunu was promised help to the tune of $250,000 against future royalties. And at the same time, we also told, uh, told Guerrero before I left Australia that if the story was published and if he just waited, he would get $20,000 for his help. In September of 1986, Venunu flew to London with Peter Hounam. Back in Israel, word that Venunu was about to spill the nation's nuclear secrets reached the highest levels of government. Shimon Peres, as a prime minister, panicked, became hysterical. Why he became hysterical? I can understand it. He is considered himself, his self-image is as the father of Israel's nuclear capabilities. Suddenly, the attention of the world would be to Israel's nuclear capabilities, to Paris' baby. He didn't want anyone to touch his baby. Israel's Mossad chief was contacted. As a first measure, it was decided to place Venunu under surveillance. When the Mossad decides to do something, the, they will go anywhere in the world to do it. Once the intelligence community established that Vanunu was in London, they met for a meeting and they were considering what sort of plan they would do. Meanwhile, at the offices of the Sunday Times, members of the Insight team, the investigative unit, were prepping staffers on Vanunu's arrival. I was asked by the Insight team and by the editor to meet with an Israeli man that was coming into the office. It was very casual the way they described it. They said he's got some story 
about Israel. We're not quite sure if it checks out or not. You're Jewish, he's Israeli. Take him out for lunch, tell us what you make of him. My first impressions of him were a small, slight, shy man. Didn't quite look people in the eye properly. Quite uncomfortable in his skin. I was absolutely fascinated by how a rabbi's son coming from the kind of religious background that he came from was willing to tell the secrets of Israel's nuclear arsenal. In the eyes of Israeli authorities, Venunu had to be stopped. The instruction was, we have to kidnap him, but not on the British soil. To avoid a diplomatic incident with the Thatcher government, the Israelis needed to make contact with Venunu and convince him to voluntarily leave Britain. As this surveillance video, taken at the Sunday Times, demonstrates, Mossad agents had the building staked out. They posed as a television camera crew. For weeks, the print unions had been on strike. It was the perfect cover for Israel's Secret Service. They knew where he was, what he was doing with the Sunday Times, and having this information, it became easier for them to come up with a plan. Inside the Sunday Times, journalists continued debriefing Venunu. It sort of evolved that people would talk to him in the day, that they'd get the story out of him in the day, and then six, seven o'clock at night, everybody left. And he was often left in the office on his own, and I felt a bit sorry for him, so I'd say, look, come on, let's go out somewhere. One afternoon, Venunu and Robbins were together in central London when they bumped into an old university friend of Venunu's, Yoram Bazak, who was accompanied by a woman. Almost simultaneously, Mordechai and this couple stopped, and it was like, Mordi, you're, you're Mord And these people were astonished to see each other. It was like a classic thing you'd see in the movies where people bump into each other and they haven't seen each other for years. The four of them arranged to meet later for drinks and dinner. There was a slight hint of desperation in Yoram's making the arrangements for the evening. And you will be there and you will come to our hotel and, and, and right, okay, so it's eight o'clock, so you, eight o'clock definitely. And then saying to me, you make sure he's there. He's not very reliable, Mordi. You make sure he's there. At the time, we couldn't figure out whether it was an accident or, or whether it was some sort of deliberate ploy. I didn't really have anything to be suspicious about other than this terrific co coincidence that they'd bumped into each other. At dinner, Venunu started moving their casual chit-chat towards his real reason for being in London. And I remember thinking, this is meant to be under wraps. He's not going to tell these people. It's he. And he said, you know, Yoram, what would you do if I um, told you what I was really doing in London? And I was like, <clears throat> like that. And um, Yoram said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, you know, he ummed and ahed a bit for a long time. Then he said, well, you know that place I used to work at? Yoram said, yes. Well, what would you say if I, uh, if I told you I was going to the newspapers to tell them everything I knew? And there was a silence for a while, and Yoram said, very quietly, if you do that, you will get back to Israel, you will be taken back to Israel, and you'll be put in prison for a long time. Was this more than just advice from an old friend? Some believe Bazak was part of the Mossad's intelligence operation. I think he was flown there to suddenly appear in front of his friend and then to suss out the situation. And may even have been sort of given the role of trying to persuade him to come to his senses and not do what he was planning to do. At the end of the evening, when it was time to go, Mordechai turned around to Yoram and with a little smile on his lips, he said, Salam Aleichem, which is Arabic for goodbye. Um, and Yoram was sort of like, Shalom. Mordi was very foolish because he, he did sort of indicate to Bozak, not in a very direct way, but enough for Bozak to realize that he was thinking of blowing the whistle. Mordechai Vanunu's handlers at the London Sunday Times continued investigating his story. It was Israel's most closely guarded secret, its nuclear arsenal. Mordechai was terribly on edge the closer we got to transmission. And with each day, he got more and more nervy and more and more uptight and more and more paranoid. I mean, he often just would just threaten to leave. He just said, right, that's it, I'm going, I'm not doing this anymore. And we'd all have to do a huge kind of schmooze exercise to get him back on site. With his time in London drawing into a third week, 
Vanunu became isolated and lonely, desiring female companionship. He clearly would have liked to have made friends with a woman and, and had some sort of relationship, but it was very difficult. We were dealing with a big story. We had to debrief him. And uh, I think he got quite fond, for example, of Wendy Roberts. We'd gone out one evening, and Mordechai and I went back to one of the hotels he was staying in. And we went up in the lift together to his room, and he tried to kiss me. I moved him away, and I said, look, you know, I'm doing a professional job. This is really not a good idea, and I've got a boyfriend. And he was, he was upset, but I'm not sure it was me. I think it was, he was really lonely. He was desperate for company. He was very isolated, feeling very, very vulnerable. On September 24th, Vanunu was out window shopping in Leicester Square when he caught the reflection of an attractive lady in the store window. Mustering the courage to say hello, Vanunu made the first move. She introduced herself as Cindy, an American beautician vacationing in London. He knew that the Mossad is after him. The Sunday Times warned him, don't befriend strangers, because these strangers could be hostile elements. They can be Mossad, they can be British MI6, they can be anything. Vanunu invited her to join him for a coffee. A Mossad agent who was tailing them slipped into a phone booth and called to inform the team of this development. Mordechai said he'd met somebody, didn't give me a name, said she was American. Um, and I remember he, he looked at me at one point, he said, are you jealous? And, and I was laughing because we'd spent a lot of time together and had some nice evenings together. And I remember saying, no, that's, you know, that's nice if you've met someone nice. Vanunu and Cindy met again the following day for an afternoon matinee. They continued to meet daily, always in public, at Cindy's request. She was playing hard to get, which was very clever on her side on, and on the Mossad side. Although the Mossad was very pressed because time was very precious, and yet they played it cool. They played it easy. Only days before the Sunday Times was to publish Vanunu's story, a bombshell hit the London newsstands. On September 28th, the Sunday Mirror published a story alleging that Mordecai Vanunu was a fraud. The Sunday Mirror story came out, it was a big shock. It rubbished him, it, it diminished the story. Um, he was very, very upset about it. The paper's source, Oscar Guerrero, Vanunu's supposed agent. Concerned he would be cut out of the deal, he went across town and sold the story for $5,000 to the Sunday Mirror. One explanation of all this would be Guerrero was coerced or bribed by, say, the Israelis to get that story into the Sunday Mirror as what we would call a spoiler. In other words, by putting a story in a cheap tabloid, it might not only discredit Venuna, but also put us, the Sunday Times, off from publishing anything more, which would be quite a neat way of trying to deal with the situation. If the Israelis were trying to discredit Venunu, the Sunday Times did not take the bait. Venunu, on the other hand, was rattled. I think it was about 11 o'clock that night. This is the Monday. Uh, he, he rang me and said he was going to go away. He didn't say he was going abroad. He was probably going up north or something like that. And I said, you must do that. You know, this is stupid. You know, why? He had wanted to have sex with Cindy. And Cindy had said, because of this story in the Sunday Mirror, I'm so nervous. It all seems so weird. I can't, I can't relax here with you in London. There's too much going on. Um, now that you've told me about all this intrigue with the Sunday Mirror, but my sister's going away, and if you come to Rome with me for the weekend, maybe I'll be a bit more relaxed, and who knows? So he bought her story that she has a sister who has an apartment in Rome, and if they travel to Rome, she would give him her favors. He said, look, you've had all the information you need from me. I've checked the drawings that you've got ready for publication. I'll come back on Thursday, and I'll be around when you publish the story on the Sunday. And uh, I said, well, I can't stop you, buddy, but it's a, it's, a, it's a stupid thing to do. But will you promise twice a day to ring me from wherever you are? On September 30th, Mordecai Vanunu checked out of the Mountbatten Hotel. 
Cindy met him at Heathrow Airport, where they boarded British Airways Flight 504, bound for Rome. In Rome, Vanunu is arriving with Cindy, and she's waving to a, to a taxi, and Vanunu is already probably dreaming about this rendezvous in a few minutes in her apartment in, in bed or maybe in the bathroom, who knows? In Rome, they were greeted at Da Vinci Airport by a man who presented himself as a friend of Cindy's sister. He generously offered them a ride. And they are going in this cab, supposedly cab. The driver is an Israeli agent. And they are going to the apartment. At her sister's building, they climbed the steps and walked down the long hall to her sister's flat. Cindy let Venunu enter first. He'd been led right into a trap. And instead of finding himself in bed with Cindy, he's, uh, he's in the strong hands of the Israeli Mossad agents. Venunu was injected with a sedative. His world tour had reached its end. His nightmare was just beginning. With only a few days remaining before going to press with Israel's nuclear secrets, staffers at the Sunday Times in London were now uncertain as to the whereabouts of their source, Mordecai Venunu. He checked out of the hotel on the Tuesday morning and just vanished into, into thin air. Before long, he was on a ship on the way back to Israel. He was drugged for the entire time. His family had no idea what had happened to him. And of course, the Sunday Times, about to publish this huge story, had no idea where Mordecai Venunu was. Despite pressure from several second guessers at the Sunday Times, the editor took the unpopular decision to publish without their source. On October 5, 1986, five days after Venunu's disappearance, his revelations were front page news. Once the story appeared, there was tremendous interest in it, but not of the level that we were hoping, because we needed Mordecai Venunu to appear on TV to corroborate what he was saying. With Venunu in the hands of the Mossad, publication of his story may have saved his life. I think the fact that we published it and put it all into the public domain made it much more difficult for them to just to dis make him disappear completely. The day after publication, Venunu's freighter landed on the shores of Israel. They held me in a box. I was tied in shackles and chained to a bed for seven days until we reached Israel, and there I was delivered to the Shabak. Venunu was now taken to a detention center in Gadara. Police officials dressed him in a hat and sunglasses to hide his true identity from other inmates. Before long, rumors concerning Venunu's whereabouts began to circulate. There were stories about him getting onto a yacht in the Mediterranean, all very vague stuff. But it wasn't for several weeks that we were able to establish he was back in Israel. The government would like to inform that uh, Mordecai Vanunu is detained in Israel by law under a court order. In December of 1986, nearly two months after his mysterious disappearance in London, Vanunu resurfaced in a police van outside the district courthouse in Jerusalem. When he was being taken to court for a court hearing and the press were gathered outside uh, with photographers and film camera crew, he suddenly stuck his hand up at the windscreen of the van. He had written on his palm the details of the kidnapping and what the flight number was, and that was the first that the world knew of how it was that he was taken back to Israel. Once again, despite the lessons that the intelligence community had to, had to draw from this case, they failed again. To prevent any further security breaches, officials now took extra precautions. Venunu was transported to court in a van with the windows painted over. Coming and going from the courthouse, Venunu was forced to wear a motorcycle helmet 
while security officials accompanied him with a handheld siren. And then the trial was conducted in ultra secrecy. Uh, journalists were not allowed to attend the court. The trial took on a bizarre circus-like atmosphere. I'm not satisfied with the fact that I was not able to release any of what to my belief is exaggerated security around the case, which helps to stigmatize my client. In its first challenge to the court, the defense tried to get the case thrown out. We argued that he was brought to Israel illegally. And that's why Israel does not have a legal jurisdiction uh, to take him into trial. And this was rejected uh, by the court, uh, which relied on precedents like the Eichmann precedent. In a legendary Mossad operation, Adolf Eichmann, a Nazi war criminal, was abducted from Argentina in 1960. He stood trial in Israel and was sentenced to death. The fact that Venunu's case drew comparisons with a mass murderer demonstrated the gravity of his alleged crime. The defense argued that Venunu's revelations were simply an act of conscience. If conscience were ever a defense to espionage, or to revealing state secrets, the law of state secrecy would simply disappear. This is precisely what Venunu believed his case would accomplish. Mordecai wanted to change the way that his country dealt with the issue of nuclear weapons and their right to freedom of speech, their right to discuss that within their whole society. Given the kind of policy that Israel has uh, conducted itself over the years in this area. That is this policy of no denial, no confirmation, policy of ambiguity. Given the size of this complex, can you maintain that kind of regime of complete secrecy in a democratic state? Governments cannot operate without the cooperation of their citizens. An action like mine demonstrates that people must not blindly follow their leaders on crucial issues involving nuclear weapons. If there ever was a case which called for civil disobedience, it is this. The judges ultimately focused their legal attention on the document which Venunu had signed before entering Demona. The court said on the legal basis that this did not give Venunu any right to reveal secrets which he was under obligation not to reveal. On March 24th, 1988, more than a year after the start of his trial, Venunu was found guilty of espionage and treason. The final question before the court was the punishment. It's at this point that Venunu became an icon of the anti-nuclear movement. After finding Venunu guilty of betraying state secrets, the judges now had to consider a suitable punishment. According to Israeli law, a traitor is defined as someone assisting an enemy of the state in its campaign against Israel. He's not a traitor in the sense that he sold secrets to a foreign power. Uh, he was a, a, an informant uh, of me, a journalist. He had no financial motive. He didn't want to be a public person. He didn't ask for any money. And the court actually accepted. The, the court has said that he was an, he acted out of ideology. For an Israeli, an Israeli, to go out of Israel and to give a country that was not known for its support of the State of Israel, to go to one of their top newspapers <laughs> and to tell them the story, <sighs> that's not just treason, that's treachery of the worst type. For his punishment, Venunu was given the maximum penalty for his crimes, 18 years in prison. The sentence perhaps is unduly harsh. In many countries, of course, he would have been executed. The punishment that the court gave uh, Mordecai Venunu was a fair punishment. But then he was punished for the second time, not by court. He was punished for the second time by the way he was kept in his cell. 
At Ashkelon Prison, Vanunu was placed in solitary confinement, with the lights in his cell kept on 24 hours a day. He could not see a person, could not see a human being. He had nobody to talk with or to look at, except the guy who brought him the food. He remained in solitary confinement for the next 11 and a half years. Well, you know, he's a very hated man. And uh, uh, you would put him in danger, let's say if you put him with other prisoners. Even ordinary criminals might want to take vengeance on him, you understand? So he was kept in solitary confinement because of that. My speculation was that he was kept in such a way in order to deteriorate his mental situation, to harm his stability. And I wish I could have said that they did not succeed. Despite the fact that Dedi Zucker was a member of the Knesset, Israel's parliament, and the chairman of the Justice Committee, he spent more than a year before getting clearance to visit the imprisoned Vanunu. When I met uh, Vanunu, he was extremely suspicious. He could hardly even all believe me that I came just to meet him. That time, there were reasons to be worried about his ability to differentiate between truth and imagination. It's not the slightest question in my mind that uh, had he been in solitary confinement any longer than 11 and a half years, he would have been driven mad because his letters were getting more and more irrational. Clearly, his mind was going. Dear Peter Hownam, I disagree with your advice. I'm sure you have some secret connection with people here and they're fooling you. You don't know their minds and their systems. The punishment that Venunu suffered clearly was not directed at him. It was directed at others. What he revealed was widely known, even though it came with much greater credibility coming from somebody who had worked within the process. But plainly, the deterrent message was directed to others. Don't reveal our secrets. Mordecai has suffered through a very long ordeal that people outside the anti-nuclear community, Amnesty International groups and human rights groups, regard him as a prisoner of conscience exactly because of the treatment that he received. And in my opinion, Israel would have been a lot wiser to let him go because they've really created this anti-nuclear activist who has suffered in prison for all these years for a really what was a brave but very simple act. Throughout the years of his incarceration, Mordechai Vanunu has received numerous humanitarian awards, honorary doctorates, and was even nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. If I understand Vanunu, I'm not sure about it, but if I understand uh, Vanunu, the punishment and the price, I mean, very, very high price like, like he paid, uh, was not the most important uh, thing in his life. The mission was accomplished by him. It should be clear to everyone that I'm very much at peace with what I did. And even if I didn't succeed in mobilizing public opinion here, those who determine nuclear policies, they are the real power. And to those people, my message has been sent. There are so few people today in this kind of, you know, day and age of superficial beliefs and throwaway society. You know, there was someone who had amazing true conviction. He basically gave up his life for his cause. That sounds very dramatic, but he did. I mean, how many people today would give up 18 years of their life because of something they believed in so strongly? Vanunu was trying to destroy Israel's security. And I believe that history will consider him just as what he is, a traitor who betrayed his country. In part, because of Vanunu's revelations, Israel today is widely perceived as a nuclear superpower. Ironically, by exposing Israel's deadliest secret, Vanunu strengthened his country's deterrent and may have actually served her national interests. In the long term, I think he helped our case. Not, not wittingly, not knowingly, but I think that is the end result of what he did.